All right, folks. I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes tonight from the book of Philippians, if you'd like to turn there. The book of Philippians, chapter number 1. This is one of the um, prison epistles written uh, when the apostle was uh, in his own hired house in Rome, locked up. He was detained. And so therefore, uh, coming toward the end of his ministry. The book of Philippians has a great deal of information in it that's very helpful to us because I go to it all the time and consider what it says about how I should think, how my mind should be thinking. You can always tell if the Holy Spirit is exercising influence on your mind by the way you think. It's the way you think about yourself, the way you see the world, and the way you see the Scriptures. And if, you, uh, if you're consistent in that and the way the Scripture lay, sets it forth, then you'll know the Holy Spirit is acting on you. And uh, you can be thankful for that. If you're not careful, the spirit of this world can be acting on you, masquerading as God. Be very subtle. Very deceptive. So you have to be very careful with it. Here in Philippians chapter number 1, start reading with verse 12 with me. The apostle said, I would you should understand, brethren, the things which have happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Many of them no doubt were depressed because the apostle was locked up, but he said there was a reason for it. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren of the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he rejoices in that. Then, of course, as I've said to you time again, some indeed preach Christ in de even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. In plain words, you're locked up, I'm out here, I'm just going to mock you. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? What am I to make of it, the apostle says? Notwithstanding, in, in, the, in other words, in spite of it, in every way, in spite of their actions, in spite of what they're doing, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So the truth of the matter is, the apostle said very plainly, even if a man's motive and intention is not right, the word's preached. The word is what you're begotten by. You can be saved under an infidel if the word is preached. It's not the man that saves you. It's the word that saves you. And you can rejoice in that. So therefore, a lot of people who are in the quote-unquote ministry today for the money and may give out an element of the truth, whoever receives that truth, they receive the truth. And the individual that gave it out will stand before him one day and he'll look at him and say, I never knew you. And they'll say, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful things? He said, I don't know you. Never have known you. Probably the saddest words that anyone will ever hear because a man who lives a rebellious life against God knows he has no hope. But a man who deceives himself or allows himself to be deceived and goes through life living this, he becomes a professional religionist and he gives out this stuff, you know, and... And he, and, he, and he prospers and, and enriches himself off of people in the gospel, he'll look at him one day and say, I don't know you. These are the people the apostle's talking about in Philippians. He says the word's still the word, regardless of who gives it forth. I want you to notice in verse 21, though, this is his great statement. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Everything else the apostle did only related to, to the master reason that he lived, and that was for Christ. That's what his life was about, and that's what his life was. And you don't get any better than that. A Christian does not get any better than that. He did not say, for to me to live is the ministry. He did not say, for to me to live is the church. He did not say, for to me to live is people. He said, for to me to live is Christ. He said, the love of Christ constraineth me, not the love of people, not the love of the ministry, not the love of the church, not the love of sound doctrine, but the love of Christ. It's his love for the Lord Jesus Christ that motivates him to do what he does. Let that sink deep in your heart. Because if you've been around for years and years and years and dealt with people who look at you one day and then, uh, you know, the next day everything may change. Remember this, your life is not motivated by people. If you let people motivate your life, you're looking at the wrong source. Notice in chapter number 2 and verse 5, the apostle said, Let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice the very practical teaching. He's teaching you how to think. He's teaching you what should be going on in your heart. What follows is the progressive condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it is in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In plain words, he became a nobody. <laughs> he made himself of no reputation. This is the condescension. This is the Lord Jesus Christ condescended. And that's the principle of God. For everyone who is exalted, he will abase. And for all who abase themselves, he will exalt. That is a principle. God is, does not think like we think. He does not think like we think. You think, well, I'm a man, you know, created in the image of God. I see things this way. Surely this is the way God sees it. I hear an awful lot of people talking about, well, God will do this and God says this and God will do this and God... And the truth of the matter is, it's just so much mud being stirred up. Amen. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thought. His mind is not our mind. God's God. I yield to Him. I submit to His mind and His authority, to His wisdom. I can't figure it all out. And I don't have an answer for everything. But I do believe this. I do believe that we are nothing outside of Christ. He said, without me you can do nothing. And this is the nothingness of what we really are. This is Philippians chapter number 2. He said the Lord Jesus Christ became nothing. No reputation. He became nothing. Yet he yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And he became, by that, the God-man. The Savior of all mankind. Amen. And my friend, that's, the, uh, that's it. That was the achievement. He achieved that goal. He achieved it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The God-man. Not Godhood, but the God-man. So in Philippians chapter number 2, let this mind be in you. Think like this. Philippians chapter number... You know, if, you're, if you are seeking recognition, if you want to be seen and you want to be heard, you don't have the Spirit of God working in you. You're being, you're being influenced by the Spirit of this world. Have you noticed everybody's got something to say anymore and don't have anything to say? I've never seen as many people in my life who have an opinion and they have no opinion. When they finish with it, they haven't said anything. All in the world they are is a bunch of mindless uh, uh, rehashing of what they've been spoon-fed through the news media. That's all you get. That's all you're going to get. Unless they get down on their face, open the Bible, seek the face of God and let Him show them something. Because the news media, if that's the only thing you know is what the news media teaches you, folks, we are in bad shape. Amen. Look at chapter number 3 of Philippians. He continues on in this self-effacement. Now notice carefully what he said in Philippians 3 verse 4. He said in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, you're nothing. Then in chapter number 3 verse 4, he said, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew the, Hebrews uh, touching the law of Pharisee. My, he had credentials. He had credentials. This is Dr. Paul. He had credentials. Verse 6. Concerning zeal persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. All of the back slapping and the accolades and the awards and the recognitions and the achievements and all of that, uh, that, that men hold in such high esteem that they brag on each other with. He said, I count that but dumb. And that's pretty straight language, you know. Now he's talking about his pedigree. He's talking about where he came from, who he is. You see, if you get your mind right, if you, have, if you are affected by the right thinking of the Holy Spirit then you begin to understand how that the Holy Spirit is repelled by pride and arrogancy. He is repelled by it. My! The Bible said, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And pride is the underlying problem with all of us. 
Man, we've all got a problem with pride. Every last one of us. Some more than others. Some manifest itself in different ways. But it's still an issue. And pride can masquerade as humility. Oh boy, can it ever. And pride can come across as so humble, so holy, so pious, so righteous. But pride always lacks recognition. It does. It always wants to be recognized. Look at verse 10, though. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Here's what the apostle said. He said the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world rich beyond measure, gave up every bit of it, found no riches in this world, none, none. And he said, Father, he said, Father, he said, restore unto me the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Now, why did he say that? You know why he said it? Because he walked in the midst for 33 and one half years of a world that is under a curse that is bankrupt. It's bankrupt. It's bankrupt. It's thinking is bankrupt. It's money. It's silver and gold. The Bible says one day they'll cast into the street. Be worthless. It's bankrupt. There is absolutely nothing in this world that can enrich you with riches that matter. You can't do it. You cannot do it. It's not here. It's not here to be found. So therefore, the only thing that a Christian should look to God for is sustenance, is to maintain Him, is to get you, Lord, give us now our daily bread. If God gives us our daily bread, what more could we ask for? You know? And did you know the animal creation that the Almighty put on this earth, they all have to go out and scratch and claw and dig and, and swim and fly and whatever they got to do to get their daily bread. Yet we lie back in a corner somewhere in a shaded spot and say, Now, Lord, feed me. We cast our bread upon the water. You've heard that one before, haven't you? But the truth is, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. The manna that fell from heaven, they had to go out and collect it. Even though God gave them manna, they still had to go out and pick it up. And of course, they had a few hogs in their midst. And they gathered more than one day's worth. And they said, nobody will know it. Nobody will know the difference. Until they opened it up to eat it, and then what did they find? <laughs> the Bible said it stank. Bread worms. In, uh, he no Notice, though, carefully. Notice, notice carefully. In verse 10, he said, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. He said... I want to be able to have within me, living within me, if this is a contradiction in terms, I don't know how else to say it. I want living within me death to this world, death to its pleasures, death to its life, death to its, death to its aspirations, because the world will never satisfy your soul. He said, That's, I want to be made conformable to his death. He said, the foxes have holes. He said, the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Pay his taxes. Fish came up, brought his taxes. He rendered to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Caesar got what he deserved. He got it from the earth. God didn't give it to him. It was produced by the mouth of a fish. Amen. God, in other words, God didn't send manna down from heaven to hand to Caesar. He didn't send gold from glory to give to him. Only thing Caesar could ever get was what came of the earth. That's a good lesson. I mean, that's kind of good to hold on to, keep that, think about it. When the vice president of the United States of America looks over to the president of the United States of America and uses a, uses a crude word that can be amplified over a microphone, if he had done that 30 years ago, he would have been out of office. The world I was born into in 1946 would never have countenanced a foul-mouthed vice president. But he felt like it was okay for him to say it because the President of the United States offered his ear to it. So apparently the Vice President felt like it was okay to say it. And the President of the United States grinned when he received that foul mouth into his ear. Makes you wonder who's running the country, doesn't it? You know what the Bible says about the mouth, don't you? It says, from the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaketh. So that tells me what's in Mr. Biden's heart. I didn't say that. God said that. Amen. Amen. I mean, how many of you have a little ch uh, boy, a, a little five, six-year-old, seven-year-old child, and they look up and say, Mommy, did the vice president say that? I mean, folks, he's second to the highest in the land. Is this what's running our country? Foul-mouthed, filthy-mouthed, filthy hearts? Amen. It don't make a difference he's a Republican or Democrat. <laughs> if a Republican said that, well, I'd lay into him the same way. Amen. They have to bleep it, these expletives. Chapter number 3, verse 10, that I might know him. And if the more I know of him, the less I appreciate this place. Amen, folks. Folks, you're only going to be here a little while. You're only going to be here a little while. Your life is like a vapor. You're here today and gone tomorrow. I hope you're not digging your roots deep. <laughs> Does God have to uproot you when He pulls you out of this world? <laughs> There's only a very few that I would kiss goodbye. <laughs> very few. And there's nothing here that I'm going to leave behind. Amen. I don't need it where I'm going. Hey, don't need any locks where I'm going. Don't need any guns where I'm going. You know, Don't need any protection where I'm going. Don't have to worry about liars where I'm going. Don't have to worry, have to, ever worry, have to uh, listen to some, some foul-mouthed uh, word coming out of the mouth of some politician where I'm going. Sun never sets where I'm going. They don't like that. They like darkness. It's a land of glory and joy. Amen. Amen. Then in Philippians chapter number 4 and verse 11, the apostle said this. He said, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, of necessity. Want in the Bible is never used in the sense that, like we use it, I want something. Or in other words, I desire something. The word want in the New Testament is never used in the sense of desiring. It is used in the sense of necessity. It's something you need. He said, therefore, he said, not that I speak in respect of need or of want. For I have learned. Now watch this. In whatsoever state I am. Therewith to be content. Now, he was learning and he was giving you a summation of what's going on in jail, see. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, that's remarkable, don't you think? Because things change in life. You know, I know, I know a, lot of, a lot of preaching today is that you get the victory, glory to God. If you cast your bread upon the water, God's going to make you rich. And you can just live on the top of a mountain and shout glory to God all the way into heaven. And things are just going to be hunky-dory and blah, blah, blah. But the truth of the matter is that's not life. That's not the Christian life. That's not real. It really isn't. It really isn't. And the Bible nowhere in the New Testament will bear that out. That's not the Christian life. But he did say this. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, in other words, my temporal present condition, therewith to be content. So it's obvious then that he would not try to force a change about his circumstances. He said, now watch this. I know how to be abased. Well, that's not easy. Uh, I don't like being abased. How many of you like get to, to be abased? To be abased, you know, means to be subdued, put down, to, you know, kind of. Clip your wings a little bit. You're flying a little bit too high. All right. Now, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 uses uh, terminologies very similar to that. <coughs> he said, Through the abundance of the revelations, I was given a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Where is that? 2 Corinthians 12, somewhere in here. Uh, here it is, verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So God keeps you in a... He keeps you from going to the extreme either way. He doesn't want you to get into depression, but He doesn't want you to go screaming mad either, <laughs> You know, well, I mean, like you're seeing angels and visions and demons and, and all kinds of stuff going on everywhere you go. And every time you turn around and you're, you're on the mountaintop and that's where you plan to stay. I'd like to stay on the mountain too, but you can't do that. Because you don't grow in the mountain, you grow in the valley. And the valley is what matures you. 
So he said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound, to suffer need. How many people, how many of you have known people that, uh, I know a man right now, he's not in Knoxville, so everybody breathe easy. He went into business for himself, started making money. Apparently his business was, uh, it became very good. I mean, he, he started making money. There's nothing wrong with making money. Amen. You know, there's not a thing wrong with a man making money. But you know what it did? Got him out of church. He quit going to church. And uh, I know him. I know his wife. I know the family. Quit going to church. As far as I know, he's still out of church. And it's probably been 15 or 20 years. What happened to him? He got a dollar bill in his hand. He doesn't know how to abound. He can't handle abounding, see? He can't handle it. He can't handle it. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Some folks absolutely cannot handle prosperity. That's an indication of immaturity, because if you mature in the Lord, you, could, you should be able to handle prosperity. And uh, how, many in here, how many in here grew up poor? Listen, folks. <laughs> I know all about it. Believe me. When you got nothing, didn't even have a car, got nothing, man. I mean, you live from, you live from week to week, and uh, uh, to a steak or something like that was unheard of. They know anything about that. All right. But the truth of the matter is, most of the people that I grew up with grew up like that. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. Went to school, school I went to. They didn't drive Mercedes Benz around and Porsches and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Audis and all the rest of these. If you got a Mercedes, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, the fact is, Mercedes Benz, fine automobile. But the truth of the matter is, kids back in those days didn't have money like that. They didn't have it. They didn't have the entitlement mentality like they have today. You've got to learn to work for things. Work for it. First house I had with my little sweetheart back there was a silver trailer, a camper. It was. It wasn't over 20, probably 20 feet long. And they had, a, they had 10,000 of them just like it. <laughs> Not that many, but... <laughs> They had a bunch of them. See, I didn't live where the generals and the colonels lived. <laughs> I lived where the privates and the, and the, and the PFCs lived. <laughs> that's where we started. But that's okay. I was happy. I was. I had my new bride. <laughs> didn't have to sleep in the barracks. <laughs> I had it made. <laughs> I don't care about sleeping with 85 men. I don't know about you. That never did excite me. Take a shower and 25, 30 people be in there and you try and shower, you know. Line up to shave and there's 20 people down through there shaving at the same time. No, I didn't care for that. <laughs> I really did like it when I got out and had my own little place. Really did. Didn't have anything, but we had that. Point I'm trying to make is, you know, I appreciate what God's given me. He's been good to me. He's blessed me. He has. But it came by the blessing God gave to me when God watched over me and he took care of me. And it all started when I got out of that military. My, my fingernails were black tonight because I had to put a wheel cylinder on, a, on that pickup truck I drive. And it was rusted. And any of you know anything about work like that, you know I had a time. Hard work. But it's okay. You know, it's good to work with your hands. I'm, I'm not afraid to work. But the entitlement mentality has destroyed this country. And Christians go around just like, well, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. You know that idea? Like God's going to hand it to you. God gives you two hands. He's giving you something. I was going to ask you a question tonight. You know, do you, what do you thank God for? Well, I tell you right now, I thank Him for these two hands. Amen. I do. I thank Him for the fact that I can still see. God. I can still jerk a wheel off a car. I can still, you know, I can still do mechanic work. I thank God for that. Amen. I thank God I've still got enough mind. I thank God I can stand up here before you tonight. I'm breathing good. You know, I don't look like much. I know that, brother. Look like something fell out of the back of a hearse. Amen. That's what somebody said. But it's okay. I still feel fairly well. I got a lot to be thankful for, really. I'm serious. I really am. I really am. 
If I can work, I'm thankful. If I can, if I can go, I'm thankful. This is what Paul's saying. I'm not rich. I, you know, I don't have a pile of money. But I don't need any. I, that's not rich. I'm not rich according to, the, to this world. But I am rich. I am rich. And I'm, what I am rich with is what money cannot buy. Money can't buy it. Money can't buy it. Amen. Do you have any riches? Do you have things tonight that... How many of you got any children with you here tonight? Look at those little children back there on that... Look at those little, two little boys right back there. How much are they worth? You know? How much, how much are they worth? And that one little boy right back there, I've been praying for him because he's had, a, he's had a little physical problem. And somebody told me tonight that that little two-year-old Kenzie, Kenzie, they told me as they came in tonight, they said they took her to the doctor and her mother wanted us to know she's seeing better. <laughs> and I know you've been praying for her. She's seeing better. Keep praying. Don't stop, don't stop praying for that little baby. Two years old. She's seeing better. He's able. He's able. He's able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. He's able. That little two-year-old girl. How many of you are going to keep praying for? You'll keep, you'll keep going before God. And, 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 and I'll tell you who will really pray for her. It's those of you that have children of your own. Or you've raised children. And, and you know, you know that little thing. And it can see better now. It can see a ball. It could see a ball. Maybe not as clearly, you know, as, as, as full eyesight, but it could see the ball. She could see the ball. And just two years old. So keep praying. That's a lot to be. I'm thankful for that. Money can't buy that. Money can't buy that. So I'm trying to tell you tonight, when you begin to look about and really understand, God's been good. I'm not, I'm not what I was when I was 17 years old. No, I'm 63. I don't expect to be. When I got a, you know, when, when you're 17, 18, teenager, good night, man, I could run, 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 run. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but I can walk. I'm thankful for it. Man, I played basketball, played it in the Marine Corps. I loved basketball. I loved basketball. I lived it for about four years. It's all I did was play basketball. I can't play basketball anymore. Anybody can beat me. But God let me play it. He let me do it. He let me do it. So I'm not bitter and I'm not grappling and complaining. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I've got nothing to feel sorry for myself for. In whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. Amen. 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 And I believe if you, if you really embrace that, really get a hold of it, folks. Get a hold of it. Maybe something comes on you and you don't like it. Stuff's come on me I don't like. Things happening to my body, I don't appreciate it. But if God Almighty says, All right, now, son, this is the way you're going to live the rest of your life. Okay, all right. If I've done everything I can do, if I've prayed, even fasted if necessary, and sought the face of God, and God says it's going to stay with you, all right, all right, all right that settles it. Forget it. Go on. Go on about your business. That's the attitude you have to have. You have to. But you must look at it too also because he's going to use that for the glory of God. And he'll bless you in it because he has blessed me. Amen. I wrote this at the bottom of my paper. What do you have that money cannot buy? That's a good question. Does anybody, have any, does anybody here tonight have anything that money can't buy? Now, you can't buy salvation, can you? Now, a lot of people try to. They're doing the best they can about it. fact is, there are men in this world that hand you a million dollars in a heartbeat. They've lived a profligate, ungodly life. They've amassed fortunes, uh, wealth, unbelievable. They'd, hang, they'd write you a check for a million dollars and not even skip a beat if they thought that they could buy them into heaven. Could it do it? It's not for sale, folks. It's not for sale. Salvation is the free gift of God. What else could you not uh, buy with money? Peace? Can't buy peace, can you? You really can't. Pardon? Can't buy your grand. They're not for sale, are they? Mine aren't either. They're not for sale. Joy? Have you ever had any joy, brother? Do you know what it is to feel something jumping up and down inside your soul? That's not governed by the circumstances around you. 
where you know that even if things don't work out the way you want them to, it's going to be okay. We rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, see, you get strength in a way that's just kind of contradictory to the world. The world goes about all the time affecting their happiness. But joy and happiness are not the same thing. What else can you uh, not buy with money? Can't buy love, can you? How many, ever, how many of you have ever found love? Some of you aren't too quick to raise your hand. <laughs> Lord, help us in here tonight. We got some hands. <laughs> well, I did. I did. I did. In 1966, I met this little old girl working at a dry cleaners. <laughs> And, buddy, I found love. It's sad for people that never do have any love. It is. It is. And in 1973, somebody loved me in a way I'd never been loved. That blew my mind. Because I knew he knew me, and yet he loved me. <laughs> that blew my mind. And it hadn't changed any sense. If nothing else, if nothing got better. I, it, his love blows me away. I can't. I can't. I cannot, for a heartbeat, tell you why he loves me the way he loves me. Forget it. I can't do it. Maybe you can find somebody else that can. I can't do it. What else can you not buy with money? Health. You sure can't. You can. You can. You can spend as the woman that, that had the issue of blood. Spent all she had on physicians, but it was none the better. Absolutely. And uh, no, you can't buy health. No, you cannot buy health. And boy, health is uh, something that most people take for granted until they lose it. Right. Is that not true? Yes, it's like, you know, the old adage about the, you don't miss your water till the well runs dry. You don't appreciate your health till you don't have it anymore. What else can you not buy? Freedom. Freedom. You better watch this government. They're trying to take your freedom away from you. I would advise you to look into this health bill and... Remember what they said. This is just the beginning. Look at the Internal Revenue Service now that's brought into it. Freedom. The government does not give you your freedoms. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed with their creator with inalienable truths. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty, freedom, comes from God, not the government. Amen. You get a government in there, it's not worth a dime, throw it out and get another one. Yes, It'd still be America. Just get rid of the government. <laughs> yes, get you another one. What else can you not buy with money? Can't buy prayer. Can't buy the Lord either. You know, he's not for sale. That's right. You sure can't, brother. And there's no substitute for it either. There's no substitute for the Holy Ghost. No substitute. Like Brother Blue told me the other day when I was down there, he said, or I was talking to him on the phone, he said, you know, he said the churches are full of activities, 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 activities. There's nothing wrong with doing things, folks. But what they try to do is replace the absence of the Holy Spirit with activities. You can't do it. you got to have the Holy Ghost. Amen. Say, why do you say Holy Ghost? Because they don't like it, so I say it. Amen. Because <laughs> I'm mean. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what else can you not buy with money? You sure can't, brother. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a good one. That's a good one. You can't buy forgiveness. You can't buy forgiveness. What else can you not buy for, with money? Hope. Hope, too. Hope is a great thing. It is not related to eternal salvation, but it is temporal salvation. And it is this earth, and it is the second coming. Hope is a wonderful thing. He that hath this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he is pure. Hope is a, it's a wondrous thing. It, it, it changes the individual. You take hope away from somebody, you've taken their life away from them. Hope. What else can you not buy with money? Pardon? Faith. You better believe it. Absolutely. Faith. And that's a wonderful thing. I was 27 before I had any faith. 27 years old. I lived the first 27 years of my life, had no faith. I didn't find it, didn't buy it. God gave it to me. 
can't buy grace. That's a free gift to God. All right. How many of you possess any of these things tonight and have these things tonight? How many of you know people tonight who have a pile of money and they don't have it? You better believe it. They don't have it. They never will have it. They never will have it. There are people who want just another million, just one more million, just one more million, but they wouldn't give you a dollar to buy you a sandwich with. But they have to have just one more million. Well, what's that one more million? I've got to have that one more million. One more million. One more million. That's so sad. Amen. <laughs> what's that? Do you have something in here tonight that therefore is, that is priceless? With priceless, no, beyond. Yes, we do, folks. We do, and it can't be taken from us. It's in there, brother. And you didn't get it in there by paying its way in there. No, sir. Mm -mm. No, sir. Some churches sell indulgences. You know what an indulgence is? Let me tell you what an indulgence is. It's when you say that the lives of the saints have built up so much good work in heaven that there's a great bank account that you can tap into in heaven of all this good work and these good deeds and this holiness and that if you want to, we'll sell you some of that and put it on your account. We'll give you an indulgence and then you can tap in. We'll, we have, since we have the authority, we're the only holy apostolic church then we have the authority to tap into all that, those good works. That's what Johann Tetzel was doing. And that's what Martin Luther got so mad about. And he went to the door at Wittenberg and he nailed his 95 thesis. Up. There's 95 reasons why he rejects indulgences. That's what it's about. You can't buy it, folks. There's nothing for sale in heaven. Nothing. Father, in thy name, bless your word. Thank you for allowing us to come to your house tonight. Thank you for the sweet Holy Ghost, God who's with us, Lord, for thy people, Father. Lord, I know this house has many believers in it, Lord, many, many, many believers. They love you, Father. They love you. They live for you. Our Father, we know that, Lord. There's no perfect people in this house, Lord, but they're genuine. They're real. And my Father, they walk with you. God, they walk in light. They walk in the truth. They walk in fellowship. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Help us with what we've heard. Write it in our hearts. And make it real to our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.